I think, like I, I, I wrote my book, you know, The Artillate War, in 98. So that was, what, 20, 22 years ago. So what I've noticed over the past 10 years is it's that whole issue you know, of species dominance. You know, could machines become a lot more intelligent than human beings and hence potentially become a real threat to, to our very species survival? Ten years ago it was still pretty fringy, but now you know, it's pretty well mainstream. It's, it's part of public consciousness. Now, it, it hasn't yet become political. You know, it's, it, you know, people aren't rioting in the streets or burning down brain building companies or assassinating brain architects or killing CEOs of brain building companies. It hasn't reached that stage yet. But it's well along that route. So that's probably the, big, the thing I noticed the most over the past 10 years. Yeah, so th there's a much greater level of awareness. So at least people Politicians are starting to be conscious that, that there's a potential problem here. Uh, I, I still feel that most people haven't yet caught on to the idea that this is going to be the political issue of the century, as important as that, and then, and then it'll become violent. So, so I, feel, I still feel frustrated. I, feel, I still feel I'm ahead of my time. Like 22 years ago, you know, I was a nutcase, right? So the so-called intellectual crying in the wilderness. But uh, now, well, it's halfway, put it that way. But we still haven't yet got to the political stage. And I don't see that coming until you know, the IQ gap, you know, human level intelligence, machine level intelligence. I, I don't see it, the, the issue really heating up until that gap seriously starts closing. Then, then you'll get the violence. And then, then people will start saying, oh, that crazy guy who died recently, that, that's me, <laughs> uh, was actually right, but we're not there yet. I think the major factor in, in the change in attitude in the public about the potential risk of artificial intelligence, you know, ultra-intelligent machines, I think it's been the movie industry. You know, uh, what was the name of Transcendence? Uh, so that, that puts the issue into the public mind. So, so I think probably the, the number one factor in the increase in the level of awareness of this huge what I call a species dominance problem. In other words, you know, should human beings or machines be the most intelligent species, you know, the dominant ones, has been the movie industry and more books, of course. Um, and so journalists are starting to, to broach the issue in, in their you know, television pieces and magazine articles and so forth. So, so the public, the educated public is becoming more conscious of, of the issue. But there's still a long way to go, and I don't see that changing much until the, what I call the IQ gap, you know, human level intelligence, machine level intelligence. So as that gap, as the machines get smarter and smarter, as that gap seriously closes, then I see the species dominance debate really heating up. And uh, then I see people taking sides. Political parties will be formed over the issue because it's just, you know, it's the, the dominant issue of our century, I believe, because we're talking about the survival, not of a country. Like major wars in the 20th century, they, they were between nation states, but uh, a species dominance war would be like a, a kind of global civil war. And, and what's at stake here? It's not the survival of a country. It's at the survival of a species, you know, us. And so there's never been more at stake than, than this future conflict that's coming. It's not, it's not about the survival of a country. It's so much more important. And therefore the passion level will be so much higher. When push really comes to shove, then, then, then I'm worried. Uh, you know, I, I'm predicting assassinations of CEOs of brain building companies and uh, arson and sabotage and factories, you know, brain building factories will be burned down and robots will be attacked and, and all this kind of thing. But we haven't got there yet because that IQ gap hasn't, hasn't really seriously started to close yet. But, but people are noticing, the machines are getting smarter uh, every year. I mean, we have, we're starting to have conversations now with our machines. You, 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 you ask for information just by talking. So 
like the error rate uh, has gone down so much that they're actually very efficient. No, you know, they, they understand, well, <laughs> they, they are able to react appropriately to, to, what you, to your questions. So that, that's, that's a good thing. It, it's a question of timing, I think. Uh, probably the, the dominant reality in, in contemporary political terms now is, that, is the growing rivalry between the US and China you know, to, to be the dominant country. So if you're like the Minister of uh, Defence of China, you're not going to allow your counterpart in America, Minister of Defence in the US, to get ahead of you in terms of artificial intelligence in soldier robots and in artificial intelligence uh, weaponry and so forth. And, and so this, it, they'll just ratchet each other. It'll be an arms race in terms of artificial intelligence. Uh, that, that to me is obvious. And you know, Europe and Japan and Korea, and, you know, all, all those major AI powers will just keep competing with each other. And, uh, and I don't see that changing until we live in a truly democratic global state. But you know, we're what, decades away from that, I believe. You know, I've been a researcher for decades, and, in, and particularly in the US, the, the major driver of funding for artificial intelligence has always been the military. I mean, there's one stage about 70, 70, 70 percent of AI funding in the US was from the military, and that hasn't changed much. I mean, certainly uh, industry, you know, private industry has got into it more because uh, it's so lucrative, but still. The, you know, the real cutting edge stuff still tends to be funded by, by the military. And that's not going to change until we live in a global state. And even then, you know, there's still a big question mark, right? Because some people will believe, well, you know, there are bigger things in life, right? We, we puny little human beings that are snuffed out in 80 years. And we're living in a universe that's billions of years old. You know, the big picture, you know, the whole Cosmos Terran dichotomy, um, the, the cosmos believing there, there are bigger pictures, you know, bigger things in life <clears throat> than just human existence. There, there are higher things, much higher things. I think the, the time range 30 to 50 years is probably, un unless there's a big surprise, like, it's, for example, we, exam we learn that um, neurons are hugely more complex and are calculating far more than we, we, we had imagined. And therefore, we need another few decades to, to close that gap. But, uh, I mean, supercomputers today have a bit processing rate more or less equal to the estimated processing rate of the human brain, which, which is thought to be about 10 to, 10 to power 16. Well, our supercomputers today uh, are at 10 to power 18. So, you know, we, we have more than enough capacity to simulate a, a human brain, maybe, you know, depending on the complexity of a single neuron. So, uh, if we have enough computing capacity, the question then is, what is intelligence? Like, how do you wire up your circuitry so that it becomes intelligent? Now, that's a huge question. You know, <laughs> We're a long way from solving that problem. Computing capacity in our computers, our supercomputers today, than, than there is in the human brain. Maybe, maybe. It, it depends on your model of uh, what the single brain cell in our brains, the, the neuron, is doing. Some people argue that no, no, the neuron's hugely more complex than we imagine it today. But anyway, so you just extrapolate into the future and then we'll be at a thousand petaflops or an atto flop. I mean, every every uh, jump by a factor of a thousand is a new name. Let's see, what comes after atto? I think it's zepto. And then after that, I think it's yocto and so on. And then, uh, well, when you're up to a trillion trillion, it's 10 to power 24. Uh, 
you can almost call it an Avogadro machine. Uh, if you've done any high school chemistry, Avogadro's number, that, that's the number of molecules in, say, a, a handheld object, like an orange. An, an orange would have something like a trillion, trillion atoms in it. Right? So uh, imagine that, uh, that orange is, uh, no, no, wrong word. <laughs> Avogadro teched. Right? So uh, when, when, when you look at these huge numbers, in a sense, we humans, we're doomed. You know, we are nothing in comparison to these huge numbers that are coming. So it's only a question, for me, it's only a question of time. Humanity is going to have to choose. Are we going to, do we choose to remain the dominant species? Or are we going to uh, give it up, become number two, and allow our machines to surpass us? Now, that, there are two choices, but there's another one, and that is that we ourselves, you know, human beings ourselves, modify ourselves into uh, cyborgs. That's short for cybernetic organism. In other words, part machine, part human. And concretely, that might be adding computer components to our own brain uh, until our own human brain just gets dwarfed, absolutely drowned in, in terms of the hugely superior capacity of the, of, of the machines.